stretching from the dry, high deserts of the east to the lush Pacific forests of the west, with a myriad of ecological zones in between, Washington State is a land of contrasts. Panorama after panorama stretches to the horizon. Mountains etch the skyline with snow and ice. Lush rain forests rich with life. History unfolds as a nation develops. Held in trust, these areas sparkle with beauty and importance. One of the benefits of life in the Pacific Northwest is the unparalleled access to these diverse and fascinating areas. Fort Vancouver, the British trading post so crucial to Pacific Northwest settlement. Whitman Mission, an early American outpost in the interior. Mount Adams, a little visited and solitary volcanic peak. Mount St. Helens, a vivid reminder of the tremendous forces of geological change. Mount Rainier, a snow-capped giant that soars 14,410 feet. North Cascades, the American Alps, a sea of peaks. San Juan Island National Historical Park, site of the little-known Pig War. The Olympics, a wilderness jewel set against the sterling Pacific Ocean. The Columbia Gorge, where the Columbia River swings through a low-level gap in the Cascades. Nearing the end of its 1,234-mile journey, the seventh longest river in the United States enters the only low-level passage through the Cascade Mountain Range, 85 miles long, the Columbia Gorge. The Columbia River is important for its historical significance as a transportation corridor for the Indians, for explorers Lewis and Clark, for the traders of Hudson's Bay Company and for the first overland American settlers. Much of the early history of the Northwest unfolded on or near its banks. In 1805, when the Corps of Discovery spent the winter at Fort Clatsop near the mouth of the Columbia River, Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark wrote in their journals about the wild and pristine Columbia Gorge. Today, the bustling transportation corridor is viewed as a national treasure. In 1986, the area was designated a national scenic area, culminating conservation efforts beginning in 1904, when Henry Biddle, along with prominent Oregonians, bought Beacon Rock to prevent its being quarried. Today, the 850-foot-high rock with its challenging trail is a Washington State Park. At Washington's Horse Thief State Park, ancient Indian art adorns the rocks, petroglyphs and pictographs. Sits Agiglaulo, called She Who Watches, is a most famous reminder of those who dwelled in this beautiful chasm 
Although the U.S. Forest Service and the Gorge Commission administer the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, there are 30 state parks, most located in Oregon, enhancing the recreational attractions of the gorge. Geologically, the walls of the gorge are windows to ancient volcanic events. Over eons, a succession of great lava flows have filled the course of the Columbia, but after each occurrence, the river cut a new course. After the lava flows, a series of colossal floods, almost unimaginable today, scoured the river's course. Over 40 times during the ice ages, walls of ice blocked the Columbia. When the ice dams broke, tremendous volumes of water raced to the sea. One flood carried more water than all the rivers of the world combined. Throughout the geologic story of the Columbia, the river has been blocked by lava, ice, and rock. As recently as 1260, a massive landslide dammed the Columbia and perhaps prompted the Indian legend of the Bridge of the Gods, a name still used for today's highway bridge at the same location. These locks allowed boats to bypass the feared cascades of the Columbia, an exceptionally difficult set of rapids that troubled the early pioneers. The surrounding mountains were named after the cascades of the Columbia. Today, the wild Columbia is no more. The first major hydroelectric project, Bonneville Dam, was dedicated in 1937. Now, a series of dams on the Columbia produce half of the United States hydroelectric power. On the fish ladders, tens of thousands of salmon and other fish swim upstream. In the past, millions migrated to their spawning grounds. Uncontrolled fishing and additional dams almost killed the fishery, which today is sustained by fish released from fish hatcheries. The dams flooded the ancestral homes of a rich and sophisticated Native American culture that flourished on the abundant supply of fish. Although Salilo Falls and other fishing spots are submerged, ending a 10,000-year-old tradition that's older than the pyramids, Indians still fish the waters of the Columbia. recent Northwest tradition, the weekend drive to the gorge began in 1915 with the opening of the first major paved road in the Northwest. Acclaimed as an engineering masterpiece, its graceful bridges and cliff-hugging route still connect the major attractions of the gorge. At Chanticleer Point, a classic photographic view entices the visitor. Vista House at Crown Point is a memorial to Oregon pioneers. Exploring the waterfalls along the southern side of the gorge is as easy as stopping the car at Multnomah Falls and walking a few hundred feet for a view of the fourth highest waterfall in the United States.
In winter, the two lacy falls are frozen in a 620-foot icy embrace, creating a winter spectacle. A litany of watery beauty lines this section of the gorge. Bridal Veil. Horsetail. Lotterell Falls. Joaquina. And many more. The largest concentration of waterfalls in the continental United States. Across the river, on the Washington side of the gorge, one of the first attractions is Carson Hot Mineral Springs Resort, where St. Martin's Hotel was built in 1897. The Broughton Flume carried logs from the forested slopes above the Columbia River for 50 years down to the mill at Stevenson. Even a cougar in a Walt Disney film rode the flume. The last operating flume in the Northwest closed in 1987, victim to the use of more modern techniques. You don't have to be a cougar to ride the wild waters of the White Salmon River, a national scenic river. The quaint town of White Salmon portrays an easygoing European charm and boasts of one of the best views of Mount Hood looming over the Columbia River Gorge. Below, wind surfers skip across the unique combination of wind and wave that makes the gorge world-renowned as a sailboarding mecca. Fishermen congregate on the scenic Klickitat River, a national recreation river, and other waterways. Moving from west to east, the climate becomes much drier, and wildflowers bloom in the early spring. Here, just outside the designated gorge area, is a cultural center, the Merry Hill Museum, where Rodin and Indian artifacts mingle, an eclectic but interesting collection. They're a standing testimony to the dreams of Sam Hill, a developer and visionary who loved this land where the western rain meets the eastern desert. His plan for a Quaker community failed, but his reconstruction of Stonehenge brings to life the extraordinary Druid structure erected on the plains of England. This is a memorial to World War I soldiers and is a reminder of the far-sighted people who originally appreciated the beauty of the gorge. The gorge today is a place to live and work, but many pockets of its spectacular beauty are now protected and preserved. In 1824, not far from the western end of the Columbia Gorge, the Hudson's Bay Company began building Fort Vancouver. 
Oregon country was jointly held by England and the United States, and the Hudson's Bay Company hoped the development of the fort and active trapping and trading in the area would keep the land north of the Columbia British. With the mighty Columbia providing transportation and the rich loam of the riverbank providing soil for farming, this was an ideal location. Years later, the development of Portland and Vancouver confirmed the appropriateness of this location. Although the stockade and bastion fitted with guns gives it a military appearance, the fort enjoyed 24 peaceful years and the guns were fired only for ceremonies. For many years, the fort was the center of social, economic, and cultural activities for the Northwest. Many firsts occurred here. The first school, the first European religious ceremonies, as well as the first orchards, field crops, dairy, and sawmill. The state laws of Oregon were heavily influenced by the British common law practiced here. The Chief Factor's house is a detailed reconstruction. Here in the Oregon Territory, as the highest Hudson's Bay Company official, the chief factor entertained visitors and company gentlemen. As a distant outpost in the far-flung British Empire, the fort was very self-sufficient. But even with that distance, voluminous correspondence and records were sent between the fort and London. When the United States assumed control of the Oregon Territory, the Hudson's Bay Company phased out operations in the new U.S. possession, and the post shut down in 1860. The remaining buildings of the fort burned in 1866, and what we see today is a reconstruction that began almost a century later. The first chief factor, John McLaughlin, earned a name as the father of the Northwest. His retirement home in Oregon City is now a national historic site. Through the gates of Fort Vancouver flowed many nationalities, British, American, French, Indian, and Hawaiian, the pioneers who built the Northwest. An early American arrival, Marcus Whitman, visited Fort Vancouver before he established a mission among the Nez Perce and Cayuse Indians near present-day Walla Walla, Washington. In 1836, his wife Narcissa Whitman and Eliza Spaulding were the first white women to cross the continent overland. For a time, their mission was a resting point for the wagon trains on the Oregon Trail. The missionaries planted orchards, dug a mill pond, and constructed a number of buildings. Only the apple trees and pond remain. Basically, the missionary effort was a failure. Whitman, a medical doctor, attempted to prepare the Indians for the coming of the pioneer homesteaders, but when a wagon train brought measles that killed half the Cayuse Indian tribe, he was powerless to stop the deaths. The Indians blamed Whitman. A mass grave holds Whitman, his wife, and 11 other people who were killed by the Indians in 1847. These events helped prompt Congress into creating the Oregon Territory a year later, 
the first formal territorial government west of the Rockies. Where the Columbia was a pathway to early travelers, the Cascade Mountains were an obstacle. To the pioneers, Mount Adams' snow-white cone on the north side of the Columbia signaled that they were nearing the end of the trail. Off the normal tourist roads, this mountain's isolation makes its exploration more of an adventure. Both the Forest Service and the Yakima Indian Nation administer parts of the mountain. The Indian legend of this mountain tells of two great warriors fighting over a beautiful maiden, all turned to ice. Mount St. Helens was the maiden, and Mount Hood and Mount Adams were the warriors. At one time, a mule trail led to a sulfur mine on the summit, the only summit area in the Cascades that was mined. Up the same trail, mules carried pieces of a lookout to the summit. Some summers, the lookout's frozen remains emerged from the snow. Now, adventurous climbers scale the second highest peak in the Cascades, an impressive 12,307 feet high. Hikers explore an extensive system of trails, including a short hike to Bird Creek Meadows, one of the premier wildflower areas in the Pacific Northwest. Beneath the ground, the frozen world of the ice cave, where water trickling in during the winter remains frozen throughout the summer in this lava tube. For centuries, Native Americans harvested huckleberries on the rich volcanic hillsides near Mount Adams. Some areas are still reserved for Indians, but others are open to all. A common practice is one for the mouth and three for the bucket. Some of the Northwest's most scenic and popular recreational areas are in the national forests. And one of the more intriguing areas is Mount St. Helens. Indian legends told stories of fire and mud flows, of active mountain spirits stirring within the volcano. They called her Fire Mountain and one from whom smoke comes. However, in recent history, the mountain was relatively quiet. Climbers enjoyed the summit view of Mount Rainier to the north. The forests around these guardians of the Northwest were playgrounds. Many people knew it as a place to boat, to view beautiful scenery with a crusty old gentleman, Harry Truman. He loved to show off Spirit Lake and the mountain that towered over his lodge. Many had forgotten that Mount St. Helens was a sleeping volcano. Following 123 years of silence, the mountain giant woke. Scientists from around the world monitored the activity. For eight and a half weeks, earthquakes shook the volcano. Steam and ash erupted out of the mountain. While the first rumbles frightened Harry, he refused to leave, claiming, no one knows more about this mountain than Harry, and it don't dare blow up on him. Volcano watching was popular. 
Saturday evening, May 17, 1980, from 11 miles northeast of the mountain at Bear Meadows, the mountain looked like this in Keith Ronholm's camera. The next morning, he awoke to this. Two minutes later, Keith and others were racing away from the approaching blast. Keith Ronholm survived to give the world this historic insight into the awesome power of nature. Mount St. Helens opened a window into the earth as shown in the following sequence of events. An intrusion of magma pushes rock upward, causing the north side of the mountain to bulge outward, growing four to five feet per day. Sunday, May 18th, 1980, at 8.32 and 20 seconds, an earthquake shakes the mountain. Approximately 10 seconds later, the north side of the mountain begins to collapse. As the massive avalanche raced down the mountain, pent-up pressure was suddenly released, causing the lateral explosion. A churning mass of hot gas, rock, ash, and ice overtakes the avalanche. Hot ash erupted out of the crater for nine hours. The eruption carried away 1,300 feet of the summit and created a crater almost two miles in length and 2,000 feet deep. The north flank and summit of the volcano traveled 14 miles down a valley in 10 minutes. The sudden release of pressure caused a tremendous lateral blast. This stone-filled wind rolled over ridges and toppled trees. A 15-mile high column of ash turned day into night. Blown eastward by prevailing winds, ash from the eruption blanketed cities in its path. It was a nightmare for people and animals. Glacial snow and ice combined with debris to form mud flows that raced down the mountain, destroying all in its path. Relentless torrents of mud, water, and debris filled the rivers. The media focused on heroic rescue efforts. President Carter declared a state of emergency for the Mount St. Helens area. The snow-covered summit was replaced by a steaming crater. Scientists, eager to study the growing dome, seize the rare opportunity to observe this living landscape and its subsequent eruptions. Today, Mount St. Helens fascinates visitors from all over the world. Like other Cascade volcanoes, Mount St. Helens is a composite mountain formed by layers upon layers of material ejected over the last 40,000 years. The volcanic activity of Mount St. Helens is a natural part of construction and destruction processes that continue to shape the Earth. Constructive processes continue today as the lava dome grows within the crater of Mount St. Helens. Tongues of asphalt-like lava periodically ooze out of the volcano's plumbing system and build layer upon layer like a giant stack of pancakes. If the dome continues to grow, 
Some estimate that the mountain could regain its former height within 150 to 250 years. In the blown down forests, plants and animals were protected from the full force of the blast behind ridges, under snow-covered slopes, and beneath ice-covered lakes. Burrowing animals and aquatic creatures survived. Evidence can be seen at Mita Lake, as tiny tadpoles flourish into western toads. Outside of the National Monument, the trees in the blast area were logged. New trees were planted, and they are growing rapidly. Within the monument, pioneer plants such as fireweed are recolonizing the land, the beginning steps in natural reforestation. Along the road above Spirit Lake are a series of viewpoints, Independence Pass, Harmony Falls, and Donnybrook. At the end of Windy Ridge, a stiff climb up a pumice-clad slope leads to a lofty view of the crater and a glimpse of the growing dome. Below, Spirit Lake, once the location of Harry Truman's Lodge, where he died after refusing to leave the mountain. During the eruption, part of the avalanche plunged into the lake, creating a giant wave that swept trees into the lake. Today, the lodge lies 200 feet below the surface of the lake, which is twice its pre-eruption size. Easily accessible to the traveler, the excellent Forest Service Interpretive Center near Castle Rock on I-5 graphically portrays the story of this mountain and its eruption. However, nothing equals a personal exploration of the monument. On the south side of the volcano, 1900 years ago, another eruption created the longest lava tube in the United States, Ape Cave, 12,810 feet long. The lower 4,000 feet is relatively easy, but the upper section is more difficult. The tube formed when flowing lava hardened on the outside while the inner river continued to flow. When the lava drained out, the hollow tube remained. Mount St. Helens is a living example of the dramatic forces which have shaped the face of the planet. The landscape is rebuilding and eventually forest will cover the land until the next chapter in this geological story is written. Someday the still quiet of the forest may be shaken by yet another eruption. From the northern slopes of Mount St. Helens a classic mountain shape hangs on the horizon. Mount Rainier The tallest of the Cascade Peaks stands 14,410 feet and on a clear day is visible from over 100 miles away. Only 60 miles from Seattle, the mountain occupies more than 25% of the park's 378 square miles. Various legends recount its origin. In one, an Indian wife with child leaves her husband in the Olympics and is frozen in punishment when she steps from her canoe. She grew into Mount Rainier, which the Indians called Tahoma. The globe-spanning Captain George Vancouver of the British Navy didn't know of these legends on May 7, 1792, when he named the mountain for his friend, Rear Admiral Peter Rainier. Later, in the 1800s, explorers and pioneers and settlers were attracted to the base of the mountain. On March 2nd, 1899, President McKinley signed the bill establishing Mount Rainier as the fifth national park in the USA. A million years ago,
Mount Rainier did not exist. But the area looked somewhat the same as it does today. The Tatouche Mountains were probably just as spectacular then as now. A weak spot in the Earth's crust developed into a lava vent over hundreds of thousands of years. Thousands of lava flows and ash flows built up the peak. At its highest, the mountain may have been one to two thousand feet above today's summit. However, what volcanism built, erosion and glaciation are tearing down. Mount Rainier is a perfect place to observe glaciers as its 26 major named glaciers and assorted smaller ice and snow fields are the most extensive glacial system in the lower 48. Glaciers are created when more snow falls in winter than melts in summer. Then the snow becomes ice and eventually, if the accumulations are great enough, it begins to flow downhill an imperceptibly slow moving river of ice. The dark stains on the surface of the glaciers are rocks and debris that have fallen on the ice from the lateral moraines and adjacent hills. As the glaciers retreat, plants such as fireweed colonize the uncovered land. With its great height, the mountain has a variety of ecological zones. One would have to walk from Seattle to the Arctic Circle to see the same variety that's compressed into four layers on the mountain. At the lowest level is an old growth forest where 200 foot high trees crowd the sky. Douglas fir, western red cedar and mountain hemlock are common. Above the old growth is the Canadian zone where the forest is less dense and trees not as tall. The area between 5,000 and 6,500 feet is called the Hudsonian zone, where the forests mix with meadows. From treeline up to the summit is the uppermost layer, Arctic Alpine zone. These hardy plants must adapt to the poor soil and short growing season. A stunning view of the mountain is seen from Sunrise Point. Driving along this ridge, the mountain looms ever larger. From sunrise, hikers depart for the backcountry. Throughout the summer, backpackers circle the mountain on the 93 miles of Wonderland Trail. Fremont Lookout, just a mile off the Wonderland Trail, was once essential for spotting fires. Below the lookout is Grand Park, which was created by a great lava flow that poured out of the mountain eons ago. And farther beyond, the fabulous views of the North Cascades. One of the joys of attending a lookout was the opportunity to appreciate a summer's supply of sunrises and sunsets. Approaching Mount Rainier National Park from the west via the Nisqually entrance, a 19-mile road meanders up from an elevation of 2,000 to 5,400 feet. This was one of the first roads built in a national park. It quickly attracted visitors, among them President Taft in 1911. These early visits heralded the growing love affair of America with its national parks an attraction that continues as increasing numbers of visitors explore the parks each year. Today, the first six miles of the excellent road wind through a stunning forest. Three miles into the park, stop and explore the Coutts Creek mud flow, where a 15 to 20 foot high wall of mud swept down the creek in 1947. These mud flows are extremely destructive and fast, moving up to 50 miles an hour. In the past, gigantic mud flows have poured off the mountain, and they represent one of the greatest potential threats to surrounding communities. The healing growth of colonizing plants 
obscures the devastating effect this mud flow had on this area. At Longmire, a small museum evokes a feeling for the past as it looks almost identical to its appearance in 1916 when it was constructed as the park's first headquarters. Rick Secker Point affords a striking view of the Nisqually Glacier and the ridge along which most climbers travel to the summit. Just off the road is Narada Falls. Winter does not dampen the beauty of these cascades. As the road climbs out of the thinning forest, it emerges at Paradise, where open meadows surround the lodge and adjoining facilities. The subalpine meadows are in bloom during July and August, when as many as 40 colorful species of flowers may carpet the slopes. In fall, the meadows turn red, and the huckleberry bushes gold, glowing with the fullness of autumn. During winter, fierce storms blanket the land with deep snow. Up to 50 feet of snow falls on the area during an average year. The lodge is drifted over and the hillsides become winter playgrounds. For a wintry experience during summer, climbers scale the mountain. In 1870, during the first documented ascent, a pair of climbers survived the freezing summit weather by huddling through the night in a steam vent. Now, as many as 8,000 climbers in a year attempt the difficult ascent. The reward on a clear day is a magnificent view that encompasses much of the Pacific Northwest. And to the north, the North Cascades. profile of rugged snowy peaks soar over hanging meadows of wildflowers and a dark almost primeval forest the north cascades nestled against the canadian border the mountains of the north cascades can truly be called the american alps by mountaineering standards they're small averaging seven to 8,000 feet in elevation, but their steepness gives them a special grandeur. Scattered among these wild mountains are 300 deep blue pockets of ice etching out the framework of the land. What we see in this convoluted mountain landscape is the result of a series of geological events reaching back 90 million years. 
these rock formations are cold reminders that during the past 40 million years, the movement of huge oceanic and continental plates caused tremendous forces within the earth to thrust up these mountains. Then, beginning two million years ago, massive continental glaciers four and five thousand feet deep smothered the land in an icy embrace. At least four times the colossal ice sheets advanced and retreated. Only the uppermost peaks sticking out of the frozen landscape. About 25,000 years ago, the last great ice age ended. Today, the North Cascades is home to the largest concentration of glaciers in the United States outside of Alaska. Guarding the western flank of the North Cascades National Park are two volcanoes, Glacier Peak and Mount Baker in the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. The well-maintained trails in the forest and wilderness areas are for exploring. The Mount Baker Highway, one of the highest paved roads in the Cascades, leads to Heather Meadows. The small body of water which mirrors Mount Shuxon is aptly named Picture Lake. The film Call of the Wild used the stunning beauty of this area as a backdrop for its storyline. Most of the North Cascades Park is wilderness, but running through the center of the park is the North Cascade Highway, completed in 1972. On the eastern side of the Cascades in the Okanagan Forest, the Washington Pass Overlook offers stunning views of Liberty Bell and other Cascade peaks alongside the North Cascade Scenic Highway. The lakes in the popular Ross Lake Recreational Area are enjoyed by many boaters. On Diablo Lake, the Skagit Valley Power Boat Trip leads into the narrow canyon of the Skagit River below the Ross Lake Dam. 540-foot high Ross Dam, one of the world's tallest dams, plugs the narrow canyon, and behind it, the 25-mile-long Ross Lake fills a fjord-like channel that runs up to Canada. At the southern end of the park complex is Lake Chelan, with a maximum depth of 1,500 feet, it's the third deepest lake in the United States. The 55-mile-long trough was bulldozed out by a massive glacier. At the far end of the lake, and inaccessible by road, is rustic Stahican. Once home to an isolated group of pioneers, it's a jumping-off point for trips to the interior. To fully appreciate the beauty of the North Cascades, one must hike into the true wilderness where solitude and serenity reign. Across this rugged country, the elusive cougar roams in one of its last safe habitats. One of its prey, the mountain goat, usually stays in high areas, using their specially adapted feet to cling to steep cliffs when necessary. With the wilting of the bear grass and other flowers, the first winds of autumn arrive.
Now, clouds descend upon the land and the rains begin in earnest. The average annual rainfall on the western side of the Cascades is 110 inches, almost 10 feet of water. Close on the heels of the golden, wind-torn leaves are the first flakes of winter. Snow will carpet the land and cover all but the trees and wind-swept ridges, a blanket that protects and supplies moisture for the following year's bloom. The magic of the North Cascades reveals itself in a spectacular alpine world, the American Alps. Like the North Cascades, the San Juan Islands are hard against the Canadian border. Today, the islands are a popular tourist destination. But in 1859, the border between the United States and Canada was not firmly demarcated, and the citizens were conveniently British or American, depending on which tax collector showed up. The peaceful coexistence ended when an American farmer shot a British pig. This was war. The pig war. Troops and troop ships arrived, but no battle was waged. Cooler heads prevailed, and an agreement for joint occupation was made. The British camp, established by the British Royal Marines, was occupied from 1860 to 1872. The blockhouse was not a normal part of a British camp, but because the Americans had one, the British built one as well, an early arms race. Still standing are the barracks, commissary, and the surgeon's quarters. The formal gardens on the edge of Garrison Bay are a splash of color in the wilderness. On the trail up Mount Young, five British soldiers are buried far from their homeland. On the other end of the island, the Americans built their camp overlooking the Straits of Juan de Fuca. Locals called the dugout fortification Roberts Gopher Hole. They were constructed by Lieutenant Henry Martin Roberts, who's responsible for Roberts' rules of order. The laundress's house is a reminder that women, often a wife of a soldier, handled the laundry for the army. Nearby, one of the officers' quarters. It's believed General Pickett, then a captain of Pickett's charge fame at Gettysburg, lived here before the Civil War. Eventually, the German Kaiser settled the dispute in favor of the Americans. The peaceful settlement of the boundary dispute is a reminder that nations do not have to go to war. To the south of American camp and visible on a clear day, the Olympics. They are a reminder of what much of the Northwest once was, wilderness. The mountains are not tall, but so close to the Pacific Ocean and its moisture-laden winds that the uppermost points are saddled with permanent snow and glaciers. The forests of the Olympics are a magnificent expression of nature's art, 
and a very complex community of plants and animals. The seashore is wild and undeveloped with a surging beauty where wave meets rock. The two-lane Highway 101 circles the Olympic Peninsula, which is roughly 70 miles long by 70 miles wide. At the center, the Olympic National Park, and surrounding it, national forest lands, rich with recreational opportunities. A good place to begin an exploration of the Olympic Park is along the Pacific Coast. The National Park shoreline is divided into two segments, a southern portion where a highway skirts the water's edge and the northern portion, the longest wild and untouched shoreline in the lower 48. Exploring these beaches requires walking, walking of the most strenuous kind. The trails are rugged and demanding and always the threat of rain. Even in the summer, storms can last for days and hypothermia is a threat. While the shelter of drift logs cuts the wind and rain, they're dangerous because waves move them easily. The southern beaches are easily reached from the road and being relatively open, easy to explore. In the forests along the beaches, Sitka spruce, one of the most common trees, faces the fierce Pacific winds. Sometimes large burls protrude from the trunks. Sea stacks protruding from the water are remnants of the ancient shoreline. Some of the larger are self-contained islands. Each layer of color on the sides of rocks at the water's edge represents a complex community of organisms. The waves that crash here are some of the strongest dashing against the United States coastline. But life survives in this area. For thousands of years, the Indians of the Pacific Northwest thrived on the rich bounty of the sea and shore. In this recess, they left evidence of their lifestyle. Artifacts from this window to the past and other excavations are housed in the beautiful Macaw Indian Museum at Nia Bay. The Indians respected the land and their impact on the natural ecosystems was minimal. Early European travelers observed one of the most amazing forests in the world. To the pioneers, it seemed impenetrable, with hundreds of miles of virgin forest stretching across the landscape. To the loggers, it seemed inexhaustible. Eventually, their primitive tools turned into one of the most important industries in Washington. Now, giants of the past are largely gone and loggers primarily cut second and third growth timber. The groves of old growth within the park are valuable not only for their aesthetic beauty, but also as a scientific reservoir of information about the disappearing forest that once covered most of the Pacific Northwest. These temperate rain forests flourish along the Ho, Quinault, and other coastal valleys where as much as 12 feet of rain falls in the most visited areas. Descending from the trees' draperies of moss, air-loving plants that draw moisture and nutrients from the atmosphere. Up the Queets River, a narrow band of the forest is preserved in the park. 
The area was settled before the park was established, and old farm buildings are slowly returning to nature. These meadows and lowlands are a refuge for elk. The largest unmanaged elk herd in the United States roams the park and forest. Elk and deer play an important role in clearing shrubs in the forest and keeping open meadows. At the Ho Rainforest Visitor Center, the nature walk that leads into the forest is an excellent pathway to understanding the complex nature of this forest. In this mature forest, some of the trees are 500 years old. A careful visitor can discover nursery logs. Small trees begin growing on semi-decayed logs, gaining a foothold on the crowded forest floor. Although tropical rainforests have more species, temperate rainforests have a greater biomass locked up in the growing trees. The superb growing conditions have produced eight or ten record trees. On the Olympic Peninsula, a number of lakes provide ample room for boating and fishing, such as Lake Cushman and Quinault Lake, with its lodge rustically situated along the shore. Along the northern end of the park, Lake Crescent, one of the largest in the park, is a busy recreation area. No roads cross this wilderness park, but the road up Hurricane Ridge carries the motorists to the most easily accessed scenic view of the Olympics. Surrounding the visitor center, which offers tremendous views of the Olympic Mountains, is a wonderful garden-like meadow area. In this alpine world, the plants are small and close to the ground, as they must absorb warmth and then grow during the short summer season. During the Great Ice Ages, when a third of the North American continent was covered by ice sheets, the Olympics were cut off from the mainland. During these periods, ice over a mile thick carved out Hood's Canal and the Puget Sound. Within the Olympics, local glaciers covered all but the highest peaks. Today, about 60 cling to the uppermost slopes. For the mountain climber, this is an area of special interest. It's a wilderness area with few roads. Some 600 miles of trails cross the park, offering access to most areas. But to get to the high peaks, the climber must be prepared to walk in and then climb with full alpine gear up routes which combine rock and ice climbing. Here in the heart of the mountains, one comes closest to the special spirit of this land. This is a primitive bit of America, large enough to be a complete ecosystem, a place for the past to be studied and the future to be enjoyed. Beautiful Washington's magnificent legacy, its parks and forests. <laughs>